Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Stock Tank episode. I think this is number 12 now. Uh, Chris is actually back. Welcome, Chris, uh, with a different stock, Verizon. He thinks that there's a, a potential opportunity here in the stock. And uh, this is a company that I personally don't follow very closely at all. Um, so I'm going to have uh, a lot to learn here today. Uh, aside from that, Chris, how you doing, my friend? Good, man. Uh, we missed you in Vegas. Wish you were there. You know, we could have got to hang out, maybe play some uh, uh, play some craps together. But right. it's all right. You know, Tevis was there. We had a good time, right, Tevis? Yeah, we played a lot of craps. I knew yep. every game. Yep. Yeah. I'm telling you, it's easy money if you know what you're doing. So, you know, it's uh, it's it's more about just doing math than um, than actual gambling, believe it or not. If you can figure out the math, you can actually make some good money on it. So, you know, I mean, there is a luck component to it, too. So don't get me wrong. But if you know how to play the odds, craps is one of the least um, least house edges that you can get, you know, so especially especially the strategy that I use. I actually decently enough, I actually make pretty good money playing craps. I know TJ won a good amount of money playing craps the other uh, last time he went. So, mm. yeah, Steven yeah. plays it a lot, too. He wasn't there, but that's his favorite game as well. So. Yeah. Well, yeah. there you go, man. Next time, next time we get one of these trips, you gotta come. Yeah. Also, right. speaking of TJ, you missed out on these amazing wheel deal shirts that he was. Uh... You know, I have to get one. I, I, the night before, um, we were trying to like, like meet up. I couldn't find him. He was in the poker room at like three o'clock in the morning. So I was like, all right, man, I'm too tired for this, you know. But yeah, yeah, definitely got to get one of those t-shirts. Um, so let's just get real, let's get started with Verizon actually, because, um, let me just start off. I'm going to have to take a couple of steps back real quick. Um, you know, every com every country has their, their tele telephone providers, right? Um, some countries have just one, some have that are nationalized. Some are just dispersed all over the place. In the United States, we have about four major carriers, um, now there's only three, technically speaking. Number one is Verizon. Number two is AT&T. Number three is T-Mobile. And number four, which used to be around, is called Sprint. Um, mm. T-Mobile actually just recently acquired Sprint. So now there's actually three major players that are out there. Um, and then you have like a whole little hodgepodge of secondary um, cell phone providers that are more regional, like uh, Boost Mobile. Um, Dish Network has their own, actually, wireless network. But the, the essence is that the three major guys have the lion's share of, um, of the total uh, wireless market. Now, there's multiple generations of cell phones that kind of took um, take place. And then you also have your fixed copper lines and you also have, you know, different things that are used primarily to access the Internet. So, you know, things like cable Internet and um, fiber optic. Uh, Verizon actually has some of the best fiber optic um, connections all over the country. Most of the time when you try to get, if you guys hear something called Fios, Fios is actually a Verizon product that's fiber optic lines for the home. For the, home. Okay. Um, the reason why I'm bullish on Verizon, though, is primarily because of the numbers. You know, I, I'm at the end, at the end of the day, I'm a numbers guy. I could care less about um, a lot of the speculation that happens with the stock market and everything else, um, when it comes to companies, like you can somewhat decide like, Hey, let's focus in on this industry or this specific company. And there's like a thesis behind it. Why you think it's going to do exceptionally well or not for me, Verizon is purely a numbers game, right? There are one of the largest, if not the largest cell phone provider, um, cell phone service provider in the entire country. But on top of it, they own a lot of that infrastructure that goes into it. And so even if you do get some third party cell phones, like uh, cell phone providers, like let's say Boost Mobile or whatever, they all actually run on Verizon's network. So they actually have a deal in place where just because your carrier like on the face is one thing, it doesn't necessarily mean that you have... Um, you know, you're, you're getting internet for, I mean, you're getting service from that provider. It just means that they're running on another backbone. So I'm going to just put my Patreon DD because I actually did a really good breakdown of um, Verizon on here. And if you could share my screen, we can go through it real quick. So the, the first thing is I, I did this primarily for the, my Patreon people about two, three weeks ago. We, we did really well on it. But one of the things I want to show you guys first is just a cash flow statement. Um, Verizon's whole business model is about spending money on CapEx 
to basically build that infrastructure and over time charging people a fixed dollar amount to access wireless services, you know, like cell phone service. Sure. Um, what's good about that business model is that it gives you a lot of repeat customers for a long period of time. So you don't have nearly the amount of churn that other industries do. So you're not always fighting for more clients, even though it is a competitive landscape and people do switch for the most part, once people sign up for a cell phone provider, you know, unless there's like some egregious differences in pricing and quality of service, people typically don't really switch, you know? So you can see that based on, Based on like the business model, the cash flows are pretty repeatable. So you're not going to see these peaks and valleys of um, of cash flows coming in and out of uh, out of this business. So that that's usually a pretty good sign for me to figure out. Okay, mathematically, what I can do with this company in the future. So you can see here on a net income basis, at the top, they've pretty much had steady net income for the last three, four years. Um, if you look at cash from operations, the cash from operations is pretty steady. You know, you'll have your fluctuations about billion here, billion there. Um, but it's a pretty steady business. And this has been the case for the last three years, right? What a lot of people don't necessarily understand though is how much capex this company was actually spending over the last five years in order to get 5g to actually be a a um a solution that people people would end up getting so 5g is of course the brand the new kid on the block not everyone has it yet but it is the next generation of internet and also the next generate well not next it's technically not the next generation it's the next generation of a method to access the internet through wireless connectivity. Um, 4G was great, but it didn't have enough of a bandwidth and latency in order to do some of the more creative things that 5G can do. One of the ones that I'm super bullish on is, of course, 5G home internet. So I actually have 5G home internet. All, all they have to do is just send you this box. You plug it right into your router and boom, now you've got high speed internet connection. So the connection that me and you guys have right now is all through fixed wireless. Um, this is a completely new segment of uh, internet access that's cannibalizing different industries right now. So your, your traditional methods of coaxial cable and uh, DSL and 50, you know um, 56K and all that other stuff, those are all things. I mean, I don't even know if anyone has 56K anymore, but um, but all of those modes of accessing the internet are kind of like slowly disappearing. And this new form of access is so easy to implement and also to utilize. And on in terms of cash flow, it's really accretive to companies like Verizon and AT&T and T-Mobile because they're not really investing a lot of um, a lot of time, effort, energy, and capital into the infrastructure. So if you look at something like, let's say, um, for us here in the United States, um, like uh, Optimum, Optimum has to take copper wire lines and connect houses, connect apartment buildings in order for people to have connectivity. Well, the thing is now you don't really need that anymore with fixed wireless. Now there's a 5G connection. As long as you have a decent 5G connection in your neighborhood, all you need is this one box. Boom, you stick it in there and it's good to go. And now you have you have high speed Internet. So the, the amount of capital required in order to um, in order to access these new consumers is actually not there, especially because it piggybacks on an already existing service like cell phones and whatnot. So it, it it's it's one of those things that kind of adds to the business and adds to their cash flows without really requiring them to do a lot of additional capex. There was capex that they needed to do in the form of uh, licensing um, frequencies from the government because that's what happens. You have to actually keep your keep your signals um, separate from each other so that this way you're accessing different parts of the um, spectrum. So if you look here, the amount of spending that Verizon did on accessing C band, which is the spectrum that um, that allows for this five G connectivity to really take a hold, a toehold into um, into the general market. Verizon was a, a large purchaser of that. So if you look at it, they, they mm -hmm. spent almost forty five billion dollars. Now, remember, this this forty five billion dollars is all going to be financed via good old debt. Right. AT&T did the same thing. T-Mobile did the same thing. So all that debt financing actually ends up going into their CapEx budget. So if you look at their wire, their CapEx right here, their CapEx actually jumped pretty significantly. But right now it's actually on the decline. What's very important 
is that the number of people that are actually covered by this fixed wireless um, access is now actually growing substantially. So the more people that you cover means the more access people are going to have in that service. And, you know, if you can do a good pricing point, if you do good service, more and more people are going to be um, signing up. So that's a great thing. And on top of it, you can see here that they've been adding a good number of people using that fixed wireless access. So um, in 2022 of Q2, they added 256,000 people. If you multiply that out, it's a pretty substantial amount of people of $50 a month multiplied by 256,000 people, multiply that out by 12. That's a pretty big revenue number, right? Same thing. You can see there's two parts to it. There's the regular fixed consumer, and then you have the uh, business. So a lot of businesses, they have to access the internet as part of their, you know, going operations. Um, so now instead of having to actually physically be connected via wireline services, they can do it through, um, through, uh, through just like a small modem. Um, and you can see here that their, their net ads have been pretty strong. So even in Q2 of 2023, they added almost 384,000 uh, new members to that last quarter, right? I published this before the data came out, but they did almost 400,000, uh, net ads of fixed wireless access. So these are sub substantial numbers. And then they're also always adding Fios customers because Fios is still a very popular option, um, but it's not nearly the amount of growth that you're seeing here. And I think the Fios part, maybe on terms of CapEx, it might be more CapEx to get these people, um, but this is the key. And if you look at um, the data points, you can see that fixed wireless access is actually catering at almost a 40% clip all the way into 2030. So the number of consumers is actually going to be growing significantly going forward. But, but right? aren't they just taking from their own market? Like, aren't you just taking someone from 4G and going to 5G and you had to spend this unbelievable uh, rate to, to bring 5G to them, but you wow. quite can't increase the costs at the same level? Maybe I no. can, maybe I can tackle that in like my super basic knowledge mm -hmm. it sounds like eventually everybody will have to move to 5g and by them yep. making the investment into 5g and having more coverage than their competitor then they can take market share because like if i'm not on verizon and i'm on 4g but verizon has like a, a chokehold on the 5g market that i'm going to be forced to move onto their network well so. well no no no. so there, there's two components to it number one all of them are going to have to upgrade to 5g you know each yeah. one has to compete against each other for better service better latency so if t-mobile offers 5g then verizon has to get 5g that's just how it is you know you don't want to have an inferior product what's more important is that fixed wireless is a completely new segment of the internet access market, right? So if you think about it, if you were accessing the internet, like, okay, let's take a step back. How do you access the internet, Tanner? Uh, currently, I'm, I'm plugged in to my uh, router. Well, I, no, I know, don't know the difference between a router and a modem. I'm plugged in, though. <laughs> right, right. But what is your router plugged into? What's your modem uh, plugged into? The ground? I don't know. <laughs> The cable, uh, the cable internet, right? You have coaxial cable running through your through your house, right? Uh, it's yeah, I mean it's it's yeah, hardwired. It comes directly through my wall. my kitchen. Right. <laughs> right, no, no, I'm saying, but it's a hardwired connection that's directly accessing another wire, right? It's a wired yeah. connection, right? Yeah. What what about you, Tevis? Yeah, it's the same thing. It's a port in my wall, and the router connects to it. Okay, so that is traditionally how so many people access the internet. Now imagine you have a box, right? Just a box. doesn't matter. You can put it anywhere in the house as long as there's a 5G connection. Usually they want you to put it near a window, but it's just there. So imagine right now this cell phone, it gets the internet, right? Imagine a box that gets the internet and you plug that into the router. Now you don't need that copper line that's going into your house anymore, right? You don't need to connect it to that, 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 that wall outlet anymore. It, it, it won't get the same speeds, but... People don't yes, need this. It actually, no, 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 no. See, that's where so many people get, get it wrong. 5G actually gives you really, really good speeds and very low latency. That's the part that surprises a lot of people thinking, wait a second, you're telling me that on the copper side, I'm going to get a, a certain level of internet. And then on the fixed wireless side, I'm going to get, no, fixed wireless internet right now on 5G is actually much, much better then, um, oh, then I'm gonna, the, have, I'm gonna have to reject that. Like, I want to see some claims on that because from what I know from 5G is they'll maybe get to 800 or 
or one gigabit a second where I can get 10 gigabits a second plugged in. You get you you have First internet home. A second. Yeah. You have home internet service at eight gigabits per second. Yep. Yeah, I do. Bell Bell Five is who is who I have. It's eight mm -hmm. gigabits per second. What about you, Tevis? What do you have? I have zero idea, man. I, I I just upgraded my package, so I know exactly what it is. I can do a speed so, test so for you. Do a speed test. Yeah, let's do a speed test. Let's do, all three of us do a speed test. By the way. Not everyone even needs that super, super high level no, I, of I agree. access either. You I know? agree. So most people, they can actually get away with, you know, I would say maybe 100 to 200 megabits up, 200, 300 megabits, you know, down. That's it. That's all you really need. Uh, I think if we're going to 4K internet and everything, it's you're going 4G, to need to keep increasing 5G, speeds, 5G, but... 5G internet, 5G internet. But what's like I said? What's your what's your current um, megabits? Well, you said you said ten gigabits per second. Eight gigabits per second up and down. Let me see that. Hold on. Let's. No, I didn't. I didn't run an inner. I didn't run a speed test. I'm. So I'm, go ahead. Do a speed I'm looking test. at Let's, the uh, yeah. thing. Well, I Let's have to go on to the actual app and shit. So no, no, no. You don't. You just go to Google. You type in internet speed test. Share the screen with us and then run. That's all. Yeah, you but it do. it doesn't show exactly what I want. Yes, it to does. See. Yes, it does. Go no, ahead. Do it. How? Look, it's just a test, right? You're not. It's not like you're winning or you're gonna lose from this, right? So share your no, screen. No, because I, I literally something. had the guy in here, uh, and they were explaining how. Here, I'll, I'll literally show you. This is the this is the exact package they were talking about. How the ultra no, no. speed I, test, look, or whatever, the, doesn't. The, the package doesn't matter. Let's do a speed test. Just oh, open I, up Google, go to speed test, and run speed test. That's it. I uh, I just did it. Uh, I don't want to share mm -hmm. my screen because it shows like the IP address and all that stuff. Um, okay. Download was 51.24 Mbps and upload was 46 okay. Mbps. Okay. And, what, and what about you? Good. That's megabits it's, per second. It's, what about it's you? It's doing the, it's loading right now. It's just doing the up and okay. down. Okay. I will show you my screen uh, and show you what kind of speeds I'm getting. Okay. Now, Tanner, how much do you pay for your internet? Uh, Canadian dollars. I think it's 150. It's, it's all 150 a month. Through. And what about you, Tavis? How much do you pay? I pay 50 a month. Fifth, how much? 50? Yeah. Yeah. 50 okay. Too. Okay. Hit the. And, and uh, mine will go up. Mine will go okay. up in price. I've got like a two year thing where they're giving me quite a, quite a rate. Yeah. So this is the speed test right now for me. I'm getting about 75 megabits per second with the internet connected, you know, with streaming and everything. Right. You can just do it and, right for this. This looks. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Now, if you go to Google, you can just type in internet speed test and they'll tell you what your speed test is, right? So you can see here, this is my, this is the latency that I have. It's 18 milliseconds in Atlanta. My bill right now, it's $30 a month fixed for like a while, 30 bucks, you know, US dollars. I don't know what that translates to Canadian, but think about how much you're paying Tanner. And are you actually fully utilizing all of that bandwidth? Because I can guarantee uh, you, unless you're doing like so, 4K, 4K all so the time. So I did the speed test by Olka, and it said about 900 on each me megabits mm. per second. Um, yeah. But it, like they, they came in and were talking about how it, it won't show the exact thing because there's limits on it or something. But uh, essentially, mm. if you do look at Bell's, I forget what it's called, like pure fiber or something like that. Yeah. Uh, you can. So get you have five. You have fiber optic. That's different. That's fiber optic line, and you're paying. You're paying for fiber. You're paying a lot of money for fiber, right? Yeah, but I mean, oh, yeah, but it. Uh, well, so, okay, so yeah, it is fiber optic line. But what 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 mm -hmm. what does that make the difference of? Uh, it's still well, talking about if I need to switch over to wireless. Okay, so so there's this, this was mine by the way. Okay, so yeah, so mine is more than Tevis, and we're comparable on this side. So number one, if you look at what Tevis did and what I did, mine was a little bit faster than Tevis. Now Tevis is paying for that copper line, right? I am paying for fixed wireless. Now what's interesting about this whole thing is that uh, Tanner, you're 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 like paying a crap ton of money on the for the internet. I don't know what, I don't know why you would need that much speed unless you're doing like 4K I, streaming. I work, I, both me and my girlfriend work from home, and I uh, I, I make videos on YouTube, so I, I want the best. I also make videos on YouTube and I can tell you, you're, you're 
you're getting i don't know you know what i'm not gonna go with i'm yeah, just gonna you say can wait for your most. uploads I, i'll get my uploads instantly i'm fine <laughs> okay the Canadian market is also like really crap too with regards to the lack of leverage that we have on pricing power yeah and i didn't go to yeah. vegas so i could pay for my internet for the year so <laughs> it's good i'm good <laughs> okay well the point is for most people they are looking for access to the internet at a reasonable price 150 160 dollars a month to access the internet is not really in their wheelhouse but if you're telling me at a 30 40 dollar clip that's easy that's easy enough for most people and especially the installation process of fixed wireless is so simple it's literally just you get the box you hook it up to your router and you're good to go there's no fidgeting around the only thing you're really connecting is the um the box to um to the wall outlet and that's it so this is a completely brand new segment for verizon and for t-mobile they're gaining I, a lot I'm of subscribers that way. now but but mm -hmm. what house does not have uh the copper copper or, or fiber optics going to their house like who who needs this well the problem is copper usually charges 80 dollars to 100 dollars a month in internet charges that's the yeah. problem Right. If you look at Optimum right now, Optimum is charges almost double what this fixed wireless cost is. And the reason why is because Optimum has to make up for the amount of money that they actually spend on investing in putting all these copper lines all over the place. Mm. Whereas this is just cell phone airwaves. You see what I mean? In right, terms of right. CapEx. Well, Chris, yeah. you bought a hardware, just to understand, you bought a hardware device that does not plug into the wall anywhere. It's, nope. it's just wireless. You just yeah, just the adapter to the wall. and you connect it to your router and yes. that's it. And, and Verizon makes these hardware devices. No, Verizon. Own, oh, yes. Yes. Verizon contracts someone to make those devices. Okay. But more importantly, they're the service providers. That's the key. Okay. So think about it this way. Two if you Canadians have an, talking about Verizon, eh? Huh? Yeah. Yeah. It's. <laughs> No, no, I'm saying you got you guys will eventually get fixed wireless in Canada too. I'd be surprised if you didn't. You know, um, let me actually look it up. Fixed wireless. I just never under. I don't even understand the purpose. Like, I mean, I've, if I have fiber running to my house, I mean, it's not like, it, what am I saving? <laughs> You're like, saving money. You're saving yeah, but I, money. I'm, yeah, I'm paying for the most expensive option. I'm sure I could pay eighty bucks a month for a gigabit a second. Like, no, the point that I'm trying to make is that you are trying to internalize it. Think of yourself as the average Canadian who's just looking to watch the like go on the internet, watch some YouTube, and basically just do their basic functions. You know, they don't want to have all this additional cost that they don't need. You know, right, you right. are that's the point. And it's the same thing here with us Americans as well. The other thing is, imagine right now you have a rural town somewhere in middle of America, right? Where there's only about 5,000 people. You're not going to say, oh, yeah, you know what? I'm going to take a copper line and put it into all 5,000 homes, like yeah. all the homes in the area. I'd rather just put one giant tower connected to high speed fiber and boom, broadcast a 5G signal. And now everyone in the area gets 5G Internet, which runs at pretty good speeds enough to, to do the day to day, um, day to day browsing and whatnot. And at a reasonable price. You see what I mean? Yeah, but it, wouldn't that be a little bit cannibalistic to their existing business if they're the largest player in America? You're okay. Two different things: cell phone versus home internet. So they didn't have a they didn't have a home internet uh, department before. Like, aren't, aren't no. they large and no, home no, no, as no, well no, 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 no. Okay, so home internet, yeah, via FiOS is completely different. Home internet via 5G is completely different. You understand? 5G home internet and 5G cell phone plans, they run on the same network. The difference is that one is fixed wireless. This is mobile wireless because you're actually roaming around with this all over the place. Do you see Chris, that? Just as yeah. a clarification, can you have 5G without having a fixed wireless setup? Yes. Okay, so I can still like plug in the wall and get 5g connectivity yes okay. yes yes the point is you don't need to do that anymore you don't need to connect it to a cable anymore you don't need to connect it to like a coaxial cable it's literally just a box that connects to your local cell phone tower and that local cell phone tower broadcasts a 5g signal directly to that modem that modem then you could sometimes they come with um 
uh, wireless routers in there, but you could put a wireless router on it too, and then just connect connect the rest of your peripherals around the house. Okay, so okay. bringing it back to the everyday person, mm -hmm. the reason why I would get a fixed wireless is just it's cheaper and for, for the mm -hmm. same speed. Yes, exactly. It's cheaper no. for the same speed, and it, and to some degree, it's portable. You can actually take this thing and put it to another location. You know, like you don't need to have it connected to whatever whatever location specifically that's just there so there's there's a lot of tangible benefits to it but the whole point is everyone's transitioning to 5g this opens a new mode a uh, new mode of um of uh of uh growth for verizon they spent a lot of money on getting the rights for 5g and they're just expanding it out so right now they have a lot of debt on their balance sheet which is why a lot of people are like oh my god oh my god verizon got a lot of debt but the truth is verizon's debt is a lot of it is fixed and it's long dated debt. So there's nothing that's coming up that's like giant uh, that they have to worry about in terms of uh, um, an existential crisis. On top of it, let me just share my screen again. Man, uh, you Canadians, you're living in like the last century. Come on, get on this fixed wireless with me, guys. No, I, I'm, I'm, I, yeah. I'm, I think I'm just kind of lost. Like I don't, I don't. Yeah. Uh, I understand that if I'm uh, going around with my phone plan that I can connect to 5G uh, okay. in different areas, <laughs> okay? Um, why can't people just connect to their Wi-Fi at home? I don't understand do that. On, why, why, like, it's super fast. <laughs> okay. It, it, All right, let, let's watch Let's watch this I real pay, quick. I pay the same amount. How is that not cannibalistic? Why do you need two different plans? Okay, let, let's just watch this really quickly, okay? Let me... Let me just explain. Like, Maybe just someone will do a better I, job. This is not an area that I've that I've covered before, so I I, I don't okay. know Welcome anything to... about this. I guess I, I'm glad I'm glad you haven't because this is this is where the opportunity is, right? If you knew about all of this, then you would already be in it with me. So the upward broadband channel where we provide internet without the hassle to unserved areas. Well, we I, I'm hmm. Warren and I'm Tim. And in this video, we're going to talk about the differences between cable, fiber, and fixed wireless technologies. So, Tim, what are some of the primary differences? Yeah, great question, Warren. The first thing I want us all to understand is that we're talking about the last mile technology. Okay, so fiber is typically used for kind of the, the first mile, the middle mile, the backbone, yeah. if you will, for all technologies. But what we're talking about is what's the difference in these technologies for that last mile, that section of the network that connects to the home where the users are, to the business where the internet service is, um, you know, for you to be able to use the internet. So how did each of these technologies, cable, fiber, and fixed wireless, how were they originally designed and then how they evolved over the years? Yeah, great question. So cable was originally designed for TV, yeah. you know, when uh, it was used, you know, if you couldn't access it wirelessly over the air, you would get some antennas up on a ridge and run cable down through the town. Uh, eventually, the internet was kind of tacked on to that same technology as a usage. Fixed wireless is a very cost-effective way to get internet into especially rural areas. Um, and, and the cost, you know, it's very efficient. And with today's speeds and technologies, the speeds are pretty incredible as well. Fiber is the gold standard. What's well, considered to be the gold standard in broadband um, because the speeds are, are uh, you know, it's considered future-proof. Uh, the challenge is it, it's much more expensive. And when you compare it with fixed wireless, you might be seeing costs of 50 to 100 times wow. what it would cost to get fixed wireless to that same number of homes. Wow. And then in terms of the speed, I know you touched on it briefly, but how do the speeds really compare between those three different technologies? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so again, fiber is going to be the fastest. You know, fiber has the capability to do fast speeds, even multiple gigabits per second. Um, whereas fixed wireless and cable are going to are going to be lower than that. Um, for most users, you're probably not going to know the difference. Uh, you know, if you're on a stable, well-managed network with low latency, um, you're not likely to be able to tell the difference uh, in performance typically between the technologies. Great. So in a nutshell, the three technologies really we're referring to the, the that last mile, getting the connection to your home. And while fiber is both the backbone and the last mile, it's typically the most expensive option. And the speeds are not gonna necessarily be noticeable by, by most users. 
Right. Um, and so from a cost effective perspective, it probably makes more sense to go with fixed wireless or, or, or something that's less expensive than fiber. Yep. So, okay. So did that, did that help? Verizon at all? is not, is not trying to, uh, you know, work in their CapEx on fiber optics. They're, they're not going that direction. They're doing that too. They're doing, they're always going to do that. That's like one of the core functions that Verizon has. That's a business that they have with fiber optic, but they're going to use fiber optic to serve it where it's actually economically viable for them to do it. So as an example, they'll have a fiber optic connection, but it'll probably be in like the city areas, right? So the guy said it costs 50 to hundred times more. So if you have a fiber optic line going to, let's say a building in right here in new york city that means that you can actually connect all the apartment buildings because it's much cheaper i mean yeah. apartments you can do it much cheaper because all you're doing is moving it from one modem to multiple apartments so it's not that expensive but imagine right now you're in the rural suburbs first you have to run wire you know you have to run all that wire to that rural suburb in town and then you have to go house to house to house installing fiber optic cable at every single house now, here's the other thing. Not every single house is going to want to have internet service by provided by um, fiber optic, right? You can choose not to get it. You can choose to get a, a, your internet from another source, right? So the company has to make a decision. Do we connect this town, whatever, to fiber optic? And most of the time, it doesn't make sense to do it because there's not enough of business, uh, business interest to do it. Whereas wireless, fixed wireless... All they have to do is just put a goddamn tower in the middle of the city or in the middle of that town. And boom, now everyone is a customer that you can get a, as a potential customer. Right, right. And you don't have to push right? all the cost savings to the consumer. You can maybe keep that for your own margin. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah, okay. Yeah. You know? I'm, I'm understanding now. Yeah. Gotcha. So that's that's one of the keys that you're going to see a lot of people jumping into fixed wireless over the next decade. So that'll be a nice nice little growth um, growth thing for Verizon going forward, right? So in terms of revenue and growth, that's one thing. But more important is that th this this investment that they made they made it over the last two three years when interest rates were actually super low, which means a lot of their debt is really long term debt that doesn't actually carry a lot of interest rates. And we could take a look at the bond market, see what their debt looks like, maybe at another time. But overall, Verizon is doing well in cutting back on CapEx. And because they're cutting back on CapEx, they have more money to commit to dividends. They have a dividend that they've maintained for the last 17 years. They have a they're maintaining it very well, and it's paying almost like a seven and a half right now based on today's prices um, yield. One of the major things that you're going to see in the next year or two is that as interest rates drop, there's two major benefits that companies like Verizon are going to have. Number one, the cost of capital for them is going to go down, which means that any future CapEx needs, they can always go into the debt market to refinance debt to do more with the debt that they already have on the balance sheet. On top of it, People are going to be searching for companies that are yielding a high dividend, right? So if you think about it, Verizon being a very big company, they have an investment grade rating and they're paying a seven and a half percent dividend that's growing, by the way, every year. That is a pretty good area to put your money into, right? Now, when it comes to like US treasuries and everything else, they actually pay a pretty good amount right now, which is five and a quarter, but that's not fixed forever. As as time goes on, you're going to see that if interest rates come down, a lot of people are going to be going into more longer duration assets and especially equities like um, equities like Verizon. They, they're going to they're going to kill it. And so the price of their um, the price of the, the stock will shoot up. And so right now, a lot of people should be buying up the stock to lock in a nice, um, a nice uh, entry point. So. So yeah, just just so then people can see, because you're saying capex is coming down and high dividend, mm -hmm. but I just want it illustrated a little bit. Uh, in Q1, I think was their highest um, capital expenditure at 23.22 billion. It's just so mm -hmm. crazy whenever I look at some of these uh, more bigger companies, just the the sheer numbers that they're dealing in. In the last two quarters, that has come down. Um, mm -hmm. <clears throat> their actual overall shareholder yield is at 8.15%. Uh, the majority of that is in their dividend yield at 7.38% currently. Yep. Uh, and then a little bit of debt debt uh, repayment is also leading into that shareholder yield. So um, 
Yeah, and just wanted to illustrate that a little bit as well. Yep. Can you overlay um, their their like revenue or their their bottom line metrics? Like, uh, if I'm mm. remembering correctly, the chart that Chris showed at the beginning of the episode on the financials was pretty flat. Um, you know, over the past let's say two three years, it's pretty flat. Now they're making big investments into 5G, and we're expecting that over the next several years, those are going to come to fruition. Mm-hmm. Are we expecting that those revenues are going to have like a step change or they're gradually going to be increasing? Because it seems as though the business is, you know, a, a dividend company where they have low growth, but high payouts in terms of the, mm-hmm. the dividend yield. Is that like, are we expecting growth to also be the driver in addition to like, I get the rates falling. It's going to make yeah. it cheaper for them to fund future CapEx. But yeah, yeah, that's that's true. Yes. Absolutely. As time goes on, the revenue should increase, especially with broader um, adoption of uh, 5G home internet and also from just pricing changes um, from the from their own business. Because remember, every business is going to be able to raise prices here and there, you know, so revenue will steadily uh, increase. Yes. Is it like, and this is just, you know, maybe uh, ignorance on my part without sort of knowing the history of the business, but did we see a step change in terms of the revenue when we made the transition from 3G to 4G? Yes. And can we we draw parallels from that? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So that's what typically happens. You have this cycle where new um, technologies come out. In This is price to earnings, by the way. Yeah, that's the other thing too. Their price to earnings is actually really, really low right now. So their PE is actually lower than their dividend yield, which is Kind, yeah. of sad, kind of kind of sad, right? But this is how the market is. This is Mr. Market not understanding how to properly properly value a company, especially because a lot of people are not understanding that the future cash future capex is actually going to be slowing down significantly. They guided for significant drop in their capex. They're still going to have to actually have to spend money because that's how you know these businesses work. You're always going to have to keep improving services, repairing lines and everything else. But it's not nearly the amount of capex that you need in building out new infrastructure. So there's two parts to even capex. There's you know expansion capex and there's maintenance capex so right now they're going from doing a lot of expansion capex to more maintenance capex now and the maintenance capex is a lot lower so they're projecting about 17 billion a year in maintenance capex so if you think about it you know last year they're spending 23 this year they're spending 17 which means that they have now 6 billion dollars of additional additional cash flow that's going to be coming into their into their business which they can use to delever you know, pay more dividends, X, Y, and Z. And at the current valuation, it just makes a lot of sense. Why is there uh, EV to, uh, sorry, enterprise value to EBITDA higher in the next 12 months than it is in the trailing 12 months? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know where that data is coming from, so I couldn't tell you. Okay, gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, the key the key to this company, though, is look at their cash flows. That's the most important part of this business. So if you go to cash flow, that's the income statement, the cash flow statement. The there right. you go. Yeah. And you go to all the way to the right. One of the things that you should be seeing is right there. So if you go up a little bit. You see that capex you see that cash from operations they're generating right now on a TTM basis because that's TTM yep. almost 37 37 billion dollars in cash in capex right now if you go down you can see those capital expenses you see how they're trending downward now you're looking at it on a TTM basis right what do you want it at uh let's do quarterly quarterly should help you help understand a little bit more okay so you see that you see that precipitous drop of of capex i mean technically you can't really see it on here maybe ttm is the way to go actually for this i think uh, yeah Yeah. that's why i like because they have lumpiness here and there okay so you can see here that their capex is right now they're they've been doing about 22 billion in capex right they're guiding for about 17 billion in capex because now they're done with that 5g giant rate hiking Mm. i mean not rate hiking that that build out so you see how that that you see how normally from 2014 all the way to 2021 ish, the capex was only about 17 billion. You know, you've had your fluctuations up and down, but it's for the most part, it's pretty steady. 
That's the normalized CapEx that they're looking to spend. Okay. With the 5G build out, they had to spend a lot more money. So that's that giant leap that you saw right there. Yeah. Nor yeah. they're normalizing their CapEx to go back to the $17 billion mark now. You see what gotcha. I mean? They're keeping all the additional revenue and all that additional cash flow, but now they're they're spending less on CapEx, which means that if you scroll down, you can see that they're gonna be generating a crap ton more money in terms of cash flow that they can use to pay down debt, right? So if you look at cash from net change in cash, their free cash flow, their free cash flow should grow significantly going forward. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So you're expecting a large increase. This slight tick up is just the beginning here yes. uh, as yep. they continue to lower their CapEx. Right. Now, the, yeah. the key to it is that because they generate more money than they're spending in term, for CapEx, they can use that money to pay down debt because they had they did incur a lot of debt. And one of the things with you, you guys should know this at the, by this now, the more you pay off your debt, the more valuable your equity becomes, right? So if you take your assets, you minus your liabilities, which is your debt, that is what gives you your equity value. So now if you're actually able to reduce down your debt, that means your equity goes up in value. So that's what we're looking yeah. for with Verizon. You know, that's why some on top the, of, yeah. That is the oh. enterprise value, right? Whenever people look yes. at EV yes. to something, it's just, yes. you know, taking off, uh, you know, the, the, the debt and the cash and making right. you see what it actually is. Oh. Now, one, one other interesting fact, if you go to its cash interest paid, look at their cash interest paid on a quarterly basis. Do you it's, see this it, on the screen right now? I can't see it. Yeah, yeah. It's in supplemental items. So you see cash interest paid? Oh, sorry. Cash interest yeah. paid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You, see, you see that right there, how it's pretty flat and actually going down? Well, tell me, with interest rates, this is the argument that so many people make when it comes to companies. They're like, oh my God, interest rates are higher and they have all this debt. Don't they have to pay more? No, that's not how corporate bonds work. If you have fixed debt that's way into the future, you don't have to pay mm -hmm. all that additional interest. It's not floating rate debt. So that's where you have to do some good debt analysis. Now, if you do have a maturity a wall- on this, Chris, I think you had a good mm -hmm. chart on this where you were showing me in Vegas that uh, it all like matures in like 2030 or something. Yeah. Yeah. Let me pull this data. Here we go. One second. By the way, if anyone's loving this super tool, it is uh, Coifin, by the way. It's uh, in my uh, my link. I've got a 20% off link. I love this tool so much. It just, especially you whenever you're looking at a legacy company like Verizon that has 10 years of data to go back to, um, you know, you could chart out everything and you just have unlimited amounts of data for entire new companies that you're trying to look at. It's amazing. Okay. So let's take a look here. Can you see, uh, can you see my screen? Yep. Okay. So the key here is that one, their investment grade, which is good, but this long-term debt that they have, they have almost, they had in 2021, $143 billion in long-term debt. Make it a little That's, bit bigger. There okay. we go. Yeah, there we go. So now they've been able to pay off a good report, uh, some, some of that. Now they're down to $137 billion. But what's key is that all that additional savings from CapEx, they can actually use it to pay down debt. Now, one of the things that they do have coming up is that they have almost $14 billion in maturing debt that's coming up within a year. But if you guys remember from our, our um, thing earlier, they're generating almost $30 billion in, in cash, right? So this is not a problem for them. They can always just issue more debt um, at a, at a somewhat of a higher price, but it's not going to like bankrupt them by any means. If anything, it's, 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 it's fine. They can, they can deal with it from their existing cash flows, especially with the reduction in CapEx that they're going to be doing. The key to it is that as interest rates go down right here, uh, let's see right here, as interest rates go down, the rate at which they can refinance the debt actually yeah. goes down with it, right? So right now, that's why you're seeing the 10-year treasury as it goes down, you're seeing companies like Verizon trade much, much higher. Also, Verizon isn't nearly as impacted by recessions as other businesses are. So if you look at early part of 2022, before the interest rate hiking started, you could see Verizon was actually holding up pretty well 
compared to um, the S&P 500 and even the Dow. So my thing is right now, if, if you want to be in a defensive play with a business that's not going to be impacted by the recession that much, Verizon's the way to go. And especially if interest rates go down because of a recession, you're going to see a lot of uh, a lot of people jumping into Verizon to secure that um to secure that uh that nice fat dividend payment, you know. So is that the big bear thesis then on this stock is that they have a ton of debt or is there something yeah. larger that could be potentially holding the stock down? There's a couple of things that um that may end up hold, holding them down. Number 1 is they were kind of late to the 5G space. T-Mobile really went up, went ham on it and they went early so they actually secured a lot of the market um so that's number one so that's one of the things that may hamper their growth going forward so t-mobile was one of the major major problems with them that's why t-mobile right now trades at a much higher valuation so in terms of competition telecom tele, telecom is a ruthless business like there's competition all over the place so that's number one the other thing is um the debt so a lot of people, they look at that debt and they just look at this company spending so much money on CapEx. They think, holy crap, this company's going to bankrupt itself before before um, before you know it. So the debt is also the other other major part of it that people don't necessarily understand. But if you do the math, the math is pointing towards a nice, healthy recovery in Verizon. It was trading at about sixty dollars a share um, prior to all of this rate hiking cycle and everything else. So if you look at, go to Verizon's uh, stock chart real quick, if you can, Tanner. Uh, yep, bear with me here. Yep. Um, actually, right there. I, so go to probably like five years. Yeah, I'm just gonna try to pull up a bigger chart here. Yeah, look at that. It's down 42% um, from January of 2021. 20 well the end of the end of january the end of uh 2021 which yeah, is that's the peak of markets not, anyway can you put us yeah, on the stock and we can't see the years yeah oh sorry sorry this is right here is uh december 2018 um yeah five-year chart yeah so you can see here that it trades a pretty good range of about between you know between 55 and 65 because like i said most people that are going to be on here are going to be on on this one for the dividends right so if you look the biggest changes that started to happen um happened after the rate hiking cycle started because like i said a lot of people look at the debt they, they automatically freak out now right. with rates going the other direction it's just a matter of time before these guys make some recovery happen so yeah no i'm i i actually am uh am, am quite positively surprised with this stock um it seems like they're making a lot of like like i was just taking a look uh where was i it might take me a second to find it insolvency here just their total debt to equity and just how much they've just slowly improved over time just constantly so my only thing would be like uh with with stocks like this that i don't fully understand and i would be uh obviously i'm not making a bet on anything on this stock until i learn a heck of a lot more as you guys can already tell but um how long until you think that this stock uh has some real recovery or is it just mainly uh survive through this high rate cycle and and collect your dividends while we're here I would say the latter, you know, collect okay. your dividends while the stock recovers. I mean, depends on what you're looking for also, right? This is a great dividend pair. If you want a good return, like nice seven, eight percent return on the dividend at today's prices. Remember, companies like this, they they grow their dividends over time. If you look at the dividends that this company typically throws out every year, they've been raising their dividends about two, three percent. So that's the other thing too. So if you want like a nice fixed income going in where you're paid four times a year, seven and a half, eight percent, and then every year that just keeps compounding and compounding, this is a good stock to be in. You know? So maybe Chris, you can just tell us now that we're sort of uh, nearing towards the end of this conversation about your position and really like what your, like, is this a trade? Is it a long-term hold? Like what are your entries, exits? Like what do you, um, how long do you think about holding this? Like just something. So, so right now, because of the short term, um, price mispricing that I saw in the options market about a month ago, 
I went in pretty heavy with the options and I did well. I'm, I'm up a lot, like a lot. Um, but my goal is eventually to take a portion of that, pay the taxes. The other portion, another third of that is probably going to end up going to finding other investments that are undervalued. And then a third of it, I'm going to be shifting over into my dividend portfolio because I have, I have, I have multiple portfolios where I do different things. So this one is is would be a healthy place to be in a dividend portfolio. But right now, the goal for me is capital appreciation, capital appreciation, capital appreciation. As much as I like the, the, the dividend, I think right now there are going to be a huge amount of people that are going to be chasing that yield. And they're going to be bidding up the price of the uh, underlying security um, once rates start dropping. Because right now, if you can get 5.5%, Risk-free, you're not exactly looking to invest in Verizon, but the minute that that risk-free 5.5% return goes to 2.5%, everyone's like, oh my God, I need to get that yield in order to maintain you know, my, my, my rate of return. I'm going to be buying up companies like Verizon. So this has been their dividend payments uh, since uh, actually 2004 here. <laughs> yep. Just constant... Um improvements and now the rate is uh what is that i can't see that on my screen seven and seven point four percent roughly yeah seven point four yeah at the high eight point six percent i'm sure the stock was quite high then or it's quite well, low then that's when i was in i mean that's yeah, when okay. i am in right now so that's yeah. when i got in but right now i am up i'm up significantly on that so that was like one of my better things so i i there's a huge Shout out to all my Patreon people who followed me into this trade because they did exceptionally well as well. So there was a there was a strategy that I used. Um, yeah, I'm not going to discuss it here, but I, there's a strategy that I used to really like do damage. You check was, out his Patreon that for that strategy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Shameless plugging of the Patreon, you know. Hey, I'm I'm I'm, I'm shamelessly plugging uh, Koifin as well, but um, yeah. maybe both are great services. <laughs> yeah. Um. But yeah, that being said, I don't know if there's anything else that you want to touch on, Chris, uh, that potentially we missed. I mean, obviously, uh, a company with a very big moat, there's only so many players in the industry, and I don't think it's one that's very easy to crack into. Um, I know here in Canada, we have two players, and that won't change. It's Rogers and Bell, and that's been it forever, uh, and that's what will always will be. <laughs> like yeah, right. it's, it's crazy. Um, and once again, amazing dividend plays, but... Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So Chris, what is something that uh, just to play devil's advocate, like obviously barring a black swan event, like what is a known known that would make you change your thesis? Maybe a huge spike in inflation because that debt that they do have is a problematic thing. If inflation goes to, let's say 20%, that means that all, a, all new debt that they have to issue would end up being debt that that's at a much, much higher rate than they currently have. So that's the only thing that I could see being a major problem for these guys. They're very well diversified. They have multiple income streams. They have a great existing relationship with business clients that stretches into the decades. You know, this is this is the ideal company that you want to be in right now. I didn't catch actually on the dividend. What's their uh, uh, payout ratio and, and does 50, it matter for them? 50%, I think. Okay. Yeah. So it sounds like there's nothing really on the company specific level that you could see as like, because I, I would imagine, you know, my, my brain would go to like competitors, stealing market share or, you know, um, who was it? Was it AT&T being first to market and, and whatnot? But it sounds like a, a mobile. it sounds like more of a macro play. Like it's just mispriced yeah. in the short term. And over the next two years, it's going to be forced to go up as rates come down, essentially. Um, yep. So regardless of what the company specifically does or what their initiatives are with 5G and whatnot, like that's, it sounds like the, the cherry on top of the macro play. Yeah, I mean, there is a risk with competitors. There's always gonna be risk with competitors, so don't get me wrong. But the key is one, the pie is growing, right? That's one big benefit, but then also, people don't necessarily switch out of their cell phone plans and their internet plans like frequently. So the amount of churn that typically happens is not, not a lot, you know, and there's also very, just like you guys, there's very limited options. So you can't just, you can't just be there to under, like there's no one that can just come in and say, you know what, we're going to undercut Verizon and sell, sell products at a much, much cheaper price. No, there's, there's a price that which they need 
to basically survive and they can't go beyond it. And Verizon is the same thing. So there is very little in terms of um, in terms of competition that could come in that could destroy their margins. You know, is uh, what maybe you can just shed some light if, if you have the numbers, but on um, is there a margin expansion from 4G to 5G? Like, are they making more money off of 5G? I know it's cheaper, like it, moving to, to the fixed wireless would be cheaper for the consumer as opposed to like a, a plug in. Well, wall. it's it's cheap. It's cheaper for them, too, because the cost of, let's say, a tower with equipment on it and then broadcasting that signal is is a lot less compared to like regular fiber cable, fiber optic, especially. So I think that would actually increase margins in the future. So th I think there should be some margin expansion there. I just don't know how much of it that could be factored into the calculations based on today's values. Yeah, I, I was just looking at, um, I don't know how much you guys want to value this into your into your thing, but I was looking at analyst predictions for, for margins and across like the next three years, they think it's going to be the exact same, like, like yeah, uh, across the board, just on like uh, gross margins for their profit. But yeah. Yep. Anyway, um, I have nothing else. <laughs> I obviously need to do more due diligence. And like, like I said, going into this, I knew nothing about Verizon. I just knew that they were similar to Rogers and Bell, to, which another industry that uh, from a stock perspective, I do not know. Um, mm. Just that they carry heavy moats and have large market share. But um, yeah, no, it, it is quite interesting, especially as a macro play. Yeah, and I think in addition to the macro play, the thing that makes it interesting is the versatility of the company itself. Like, it's mispriced. Um, there's the strong Kager on a macro level of from a consumer perspective rising, right? And then they have they have the investment to to look forward to as a as a tailwind. In addition, and you get a nice healthy dividend on top of all of that. Yeah, and, and do you think that this don't forget there was. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was just no, going to say, say, do you think this only works as like a options play? Because uh, I'm assuming that the actual stock is not going no, to be no, too no, no, no. You, you, but... you can buy the stock too. The stock okay. is fine to buy, but the value, in my opinion, well, I mean, to be honest, the, the value of those options have skyrocketed. Um, so I, I don't yeah, know. Now, if, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't know if necessarily the options is the way to go for any new entrance because i paid like two dollars a contract and i have over i have a lot of contracts so right now it's trading at almost four dollars and fifty cents uh for those same contracts i'm not going to mention which strike but basically it's yeah it's um yeah it's i'm not sure the value well technically speaking it's hard to value what the terminal rate is going to be the 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 for this, but for most people, for most retail investors, I would caution them against doing the options part of this and just say, just do the stock, just buy the stock. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm not, unless, I'm not telling anyone to do. Unless it. you're part of, a, <laughs> unless you're part of my Patreon, then I'll give you the down low on what it is. But <laughs> yeah, sorry. Yeah. Is you there know. is there any price on those contracts that you like are like okay, this is my price target, I'm out, or is it more of a time? thing when you see the catalyst forming on the macro regardless of the price it's a, it's the catalyst for me right now my price targets are much much higher than what they are like what the currently the stock is trading at today but like i said that's that unlike other people i adjust my price targets as the business goes up down left right you yeah. know so yeah and and this is uh, separate from Verizon but just something i thought i heard you talk about on finance junkies and I can cut this out if you don't want it in, but I thought you were going to slow down on the the Patreon. And didn't you say that on Finance Junkies? Yeah, yeah, I slowed I slowed down a little bit here and there, but there are some people who actually gave me some good um good ways to basically manage my time. Mm, so like okay. right now, I'm doing a lot less in terms of communicating like one on one with a lot of people, and instead just doing more broader conversations. Yeah. You know. So yeah. that's been that's been helpful. I think the initial Patreon when I started it, it was just it felt like a lot of work and I was being overwhelmed by overwhelming. It. Yeah. But but now the Patreon actually added a, f a couple of new features that have been helpful. Like I did not want to do a discord like I know people that have Patreon discords that are so I hate discord with a passion because it feels like you're signing into a chat room and everyone's just blah, 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 blah. And then you have like a hundred threads on there and everyone's like, blah, 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 blah. And it just doesn't feel very like personal. 
Whereas the Patreon that I have, I do a lot of posts on Patreon. Like if you look at me, I've only been, I've only had Patreon for like a couple of months and I think I'm at like a hundred something posts, you know? Mm. So one, I do a lot of posts and two, all the data that I have, I pretty much put it out there. And then, um, and then one other thing is they do have like this chat feature now, which is not a hundred percent like discord, but it's similar, but it doesn't have a lot of the more fancier bells and whistles, but I like it. I like simplicity. So if you're looking for simplicity, that's the way that I would go. Gotcha. Gotcha. Well, yeah. um, yeah, I, I don't have any other questions unless you do Tevis all rap and, uh, Appreciate everyone that watched. Hopefully you guys enjoyed this episode of the stock tank for Verizon. Uh, I obviously need to do a lot more due diligence <laughs> on telecommunications yeah. companies. But aside from that, everyone, thank you so much for watching and bye for now. All right. Have a good one. Take care. Thanks, everybody. Hey, Chris. Yep.